In this video lecture, we're going to just concentrate on the hormonal regulation of the ovarian and uterine cycle. So remember, the ovarian cycle pertains to what's going on in the ovaries. Uterine cycle is what's going on in the uterus. However, they are synchronized together, and the hormones are overlapping between them, too. To help kind of follow this, the general idea, keep in mind that the hormone cycles have kind of a hierarchy of control in that the hypothalamus controls the pituitary, which controls the ovaries, which controls the uterus. And so GnRH is a hypothalamic hormone, it's a gonadotropin-releasing hormone. When it's secreted in pulses, then that's going to influence the anterior pituitary hormones of FSH and LH, FSH being follicle-stimulating hormone, LH is luteinizing hormone. So those pulses influence how much FSH and LH are secreted. And then the FSH and LH controls how much progesterone and estrogen from the ovaries is secreted. And then those progesterone and estrogen levels are going to have a negative feedback effect on GnRH. So they're going to inhibit GnRH and therefore limit the number of pulses produced by GnRH. So that way, again, we still have a, a negative feedback system working here. It's just GnRH controls FSH and LH. FSH and LH control estrogen and progesterone. And then that comes back as inhibiting GnRH, okay, in general. So now let's look at more specifics. Again, I'm going to have a picture here of describing what's going on in the ovarian cycle. The description of it is found on the next two slides. So you want to follow along on those slides. So first, starting at one, GnRH is secreted from the hypothalamus. It causes an increase in secretions of FSH and LH. Now FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, kind of makes sense. It causes the follicles to grow. So remember, every month you get a few follicles developing. As those follicles develop, they start releasing estrogen. Now the estrogen then goes back and inhibits the release of FSH and LH, but only at low levels. Think at low levels of estrogen means you're inhibiting the release of FSH and LH. So you're gonna have some FSH and LH made, but it's just gonna accumulate in that anterior pituitary. Also, the follicle releases inhibin, and inhibin also has a negative effect on FSH and LH release. So again, it's going to stop FSH and LH from being released, okay? Now, this is gonna cause then a slight dip in the level of FSH that's produced, or, or released, I should say. So FSH, again, is follicle stimulating, so it's causing the follicle to develop. But now if I have a dip in FSH levels, then that's going to affect the follicle growth. Now they think that only the most dominant follicle has enough follicle um, receptors or follicle stimulating hormone receptors to be able to handle this slight dip in FSH. So since they have more receptors, they can deal with low levels of, a lower level of FSH. The other follicles, the follicles that aren't the dominant ones, they're not quite as far along as the dominant one in, is the ones that don't have those high FSH receptors, and therefore a dip in FSH means they can't get enough FSH to continue development, and so then they die off. So only the dominant follicle can continue to grow and develop. Now as this follicle continues to develop, it releases more and more estrogen. At some point we reach a critical level of estrogen and that stimulates now the release of FSH and particularly LH. With a surge in LH you get ovulation. So now the secondary oocyte here has been released from the follicle. Now the follicle then becomes the corpus luteum. Now the corpus luteum is in charge of producing estrogen, progesterone, and inhibin. Progesterone levels particularly are high that they inhibit GnRH. Now inhibiting the GnRH then means no more follicle development. 
Because remember, we're anticipating pregnancy. So this corpus luteum, by secreting progesterone and estrogen and inhibin, inhibiting GnRH, if we're pregnant, we don't want any more follicles developing. So we want to stop the ovarian cycle as long as we're pregnant. So as long as the corpus luteum is intact, there's no more follicle development, okay? If there's no pregnancy, the corpus luteum will degenerate and become the corpus albicans, and then the corpus albicans doesn't make the progesterone and estrogen, so now there's no more inhibition of GnRH, which means we start the cycle all over again. So GnRH is released, we get FSH and LH released, more follicles develop, and, and then we go through the cycle again. Now this slide will show us then kind of hormone levels of what's going on. So again, just to kind of refresh this and look at this, what's going on. Okay, GnRH causes a release of FSH and LH. An increase in FSH levels causes the follicle to develop. As the follicle develops, it starts producing estrogen. Low levels of estrogen means an inhibition of the release of FSH and LH, so you can see FSH levels particularly start to decline. That means then only the dominant follicle can handle that decline because it has the more receptors. So it continues to develop. The other ones die away, die away. Now the dominant follicle then continues to release estrogen. We hit a critical level that causes a surge in the release of LH. LH is what causes the ovulation. Then following ovulation, we enter that luteal phase because that's when we have the corpus luteum developing. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone and estrogens, but the progesterone in particular causes inhibition of GnRH and therefore FSH and LH, so our FSH levels particularly decline, so no more follicle development as long as we have that corpus luteum. If there is no pregnancy, it degenerates the corpus albicans, which cannot produce progesterone, so our progesterone levels decline. That means then no more inhibition and we're going to start all over again, and GnRH secretions are going to increase, which means FSH and LH increases, and we start this ovarian cycle again. Now let's look at the uterine or menstrual cycle. This one's divided into three phases. We have the menstrual phase, which is menses, or when um, you have your period, the proliferative or preovulatory phase, and then the secretory phase. So you can see up here what's going on with the ovarian cycle and the release of the estrogens and progesterones and how that's going to affect the lining of the uterus. Okay? And we'll look at each one of these um, levels and see how what's going on. So first with the menstrual phase. Now with the menstrual phase, it's the sloughing off of the functional layer of the endometrial tissue and that first five days of our cycle. And this is because of the decline in levels of progesterone and estrogen. That leads to loss of that functional layer. Now typically a woman loses about 40 milliliters of blood and 35 milliliters of fluids uh, per month. By day five, the next follicle is starting to grow, or the follicles, I should say, are growing, and that means production of estrogen and that means then as estrogen levels rise, that means the we're going to enter the proliferative phase and start building up that um, endometrial lining. So here we are in the proliferative phase with rising levels of estrogen. The endometrial tissue is uh, being increased in size due to mitosis. Remember, the basal layer is in charge of replacing the lost functional layer. And so it's all the mitotic action of that basal layer that increases the thickness of the functional layer during this proliferative phase. So it gets about two to three millimeters in thickness. Also during this time, the cervical mucus that kind of covers up the cervix starts to become thin and form channels and this is anticipation that there might be a sperm swimming through there. We want to get ready so that if uh, ovulate and that sperm can then get up there and get to that egg and cause pregnancy. Then we enter the secretary phase. In the secretary phase, um, remember this is post-ovulation. 
So now, because of the corpus luteum, we have a huge amount of progesterone secreted. That progesterone then stimulates the endometrial glands to secrete fluid and accumulate nutrients um, in that uterine cavity to help sustain the embryo until it gets implanted and forms a placenta. So now the thickening of that functional layer is all due to secretions, not because of mitosis, but it does get five to six millimeters thickness. So just remember secretory phase is secretions that are causing that functional layer to get thick. Also, since we're past ovulation, don't want any more sperm coming up, don't need them anymore because if the sperm weren't there, they're not going to fertilize the egg now. So we're going to make the cervical plug or the mucus um, real thick and that means we have a cervical plug. Um, and that's just protection. We want to protect hopefully a developing embryo from any um, infections via the vagina. And so we plug that up to prevent any type of, of infections coming up into the uterus. If there's no pregnancy, then the progesterone levels are going to decline because that corpus luteum degenerates. And then that causes the functional layer to slough off and we've moved back into the menstrual phase. Now, if a pregnancy occurs, we can see what's going on in this slide. So again, Let's just kind of review. We've got rising estrogen levels causes a surge in LH. That's what causes the um, ovulation. So rising estrogen levels means in the proliferative phase, we get the buildup of the functional layer of the endometrium. After that, rising progesterone levels means the secretory phase continues. That corpus luteum is producing the progesterones. If there's an embryo like here that's going to implant into the wall of the endometrium, the embryo starts producing a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. That hormone is in charge of maintaining the corpus luteum. So by maintaining the corpus luteum, then it keeps secreting progesterone and progesterone levels continue to rise and that maintains this uterine lining. And that's going to happen until finally the embryo forms a placenta with the endometrial cells of the mother and the placenta will start taking over in producing progesterone to again maintain the endometrial lining through the rest of the pregnancy. The human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, that HCG, is the basis for uh, pregnancy tests. So the dipsticks that you see um, you know, you in the dip sticks of urine and you get the little, you know, pink line indicating you're pregnant. That's basically an antibody test with HCG. So you can actually find out if you're pregnant just seven days after ovulation or seven days into the pregnancy. Now here's a summary of the whole process. Again, looking here at the ovarian cycle the uterine cycle, and then here's all the hormone levels rising and declining. I actually had a student once tell me, why do women get so moody? I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this rise and drop of all these hormones. I'd be, I'm definitely moody. Um, so let's kind of run through this again. So here's the follicles developing during the follicular phase. That's due to the FSH and LH, particularly FSH levels rising as the follicle develops, we start producing estrogens. Those estrogens cause the proliferative phase of the uterus, that is the increase in the um, thickening of that functional layer of the endometrium. So we can see here rising levels of estrogen. Now low levels of estrogen means a decrease in FSH release, so FSH levels go down a little bit. That means only the mature, the most dominant follicle ends up maturing and then we get rising levels of estrogen from the follicle will cause a surge in LH and that's what triggers ovulation. With a surge in LH notice that the estrogen levels decline but the corpus luteum starts producing progesterone and estrogens and so those levels rise particularly the progesterone. It's the progesterone that triggers the secretory phase to maintain that endometrium and continue to secrete nutrients and fluids in anticipation of pregnancy.
If the corpus luteum is maintained, that means the endometrial lining will be maintained. But if there's no embryo to secrete the human chorionic gonadotropin hormone to maintain the corpus luteum, the corpus luteum degenerates into the corpus albicans, which means progesterone levels decline, and therefore you get menses or your period. And then the cycle starts all over again with the menses. So body fat plays a role in when uh, puberty starts. There's a hormone called leptin that's produced by the fatty tissue of the hypothalamus. If, fatty, if the amount of fatty tissue is low, that means then leptin levels are low, and that's going to cause a delay in puberty. So it triggers or inhibits the release of GnRH so you don't get the tr start of a cycle. If leptin levels are high, then that's going to cause the release of GnRH and then FSH and LH at the right timing. Um, and so then that way, um, girl starts her period and actually enters menseria earlier. Amenorrhea is when you stop having your period. The most common reason is female athletes who, when they're training intensely, they have very little body fat. So with very little body fat means less leptin. Low levels of leptin then tells the hypothalamus again that you just don't have the energy stores to produce a baby, so don't even try. And that's going to basically shut the cycle down. And this is the same thing I should have mentioned for the puberty. The idea is you don't want to start menses until you have the fat stores necessary to be able to handle pregnancy. So you're going to delay puberty until the body is is ready to deal with pregnancies. That's going to end our look at the hormonal cycles of the female. So now the next video lecture we're going to look basically is whether you should be pregnant or how do you get pregnant versus not getting pregnant.